deeply is seized with. Ensuring a, vi a vibrant platform that supports the strengthened engagement of civil society in UN affairs has been a priority of this president. Since assuming office, he has organized three high level events as well as the special session on COVID-19 with strong participation from key stakeholders, including civil society. In the coming months, the president will convene a high level meeting on water, a thematic debate on digital cooperation and connectivity, a high level event on culture and, sustain and sustainable development, a joint thematic event on least developed countries and a high level forum on the culture of peace among others all with civil society participation. Before we begin, a few words about His Excellency, Mr. Boskier. He is a distinguished diplomat and career foreign service member. He joined Turkey's foreign service in 1972 and has held several prominent positions, including permanent representative of Turkey to the European Union, ambassador to Romania, first secretary, secretary of the embassy in Iraq and secretary general for EU affairs. Mr. Boskir was an elected member of the Turkish parliament for nine years and he also served as the minister for EU affairs and chief negotiator from 2014 to 2016. In 2018, he was elected for the fourth time as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Grand National Assembly of Turkey. Your Excellency, we thank you once again for spending time and we look forward to a dynamic conversation today. We will first hear your remarks and then follow with questions from our civil society representatives. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Svenning, Melissa, and uh, good morning, dear friends. It's a pleasure to be here today and to have the opportunity to engage with the civil society uh, community. Uh, we often say that the General Assembly is the most democratic body of the most multilateral institution in the world. It is uh, therefore essential that the views and inputs of civil society groups, which are broad and diverse, are taken into consideration on a regular basis. I'm pleased to be able to continue the tradition of speaking with the civil society organizations one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Though, of course, uh, I, I wish we could have been doing this in person. Before I outline our priorities uh, for the remainder of the 75th session, allow me to acknowledge the importance we place upon civil society inputs and collaboration, and commend you uh, for your perseverance uh, during a very challenging year. Uh, it goes without saying that <clears throat> the COVID-19 pandemic has been a challenge for all of us. For our part, it is fair to say that it has tested the systems of the UN and how we work. We have learned uh, many lessons uh, through this, uh, one of which that we need to make special efforts to accommodate civil society groups and others uh, who have struggled to connect with the UN during this period. Trust me, uh, when I say your concerns have been heard <clears throat> and we are endeavoring to find ways to accommodate all those uh, who wish to be involved. I'm uh, pleased to recall the valuable contributions by the distinguished representatives of civil society to all of the high level meetings that I have convened since the beginning of the 75th session. We have heard from youth representatives, young women and indigenous leaders, humanitarian actors, local administrations, representatives of the scientific community, organizations working on women's rights in health sector, as well as from the chief ex executives of uh, major international NGOs such as Save the Children and uh, WWF International. I once again uh, thank uh, all of them. I also <clears throat> applaud all civil society organizations that quickly adapted their working methods in order to support their communities. You have uh, once again demonstrated your unwavering commitment uh, to progress. 
I know you are understandably eager to hear about the upcoming events and priorities of the General Assembly for the remainder of the session. Uh, Melissa has, uh, in a way, shortly outlined uh, what I was uh, planning to share with you. So I wouldn't, uh, I, I think I shouldn't lose more time, uh, which I, I would like to dedicate to you to answer to your questions and uh, to have this uh, dialogue. Uh, I think uh, uh, I think the important thing is uh, here. Uh, after uh, we in the questions, I can also answer to what type of meetings we're going to have. How is the civil society going to be a part of it? But uh, I think uh, uh, the important thing here is to address the most pressing question: How will civil society representatives? engage in these events we're planning uh, for the rest of the 75th session. The short answer is that this differs from one event to the next. In most cases, member states set out specific modalities for each event. In some cases, these were determined prior to the pandemic. So my team is working with partners across the UN system to identify where and how civil society groups can contribute in some cases, this may include participating in panel discussions, whether what will be in person or virtual participation or the submission of pre-recorded video messages or materials. But I assure you that my team remains in close contact with the civil society unit to ensure that information for engaging in various events is clearly uh, outlined. Before I turn it over to Melissa again, uh, allow me to note the major teams that run throughout the entirety of this session. Firstly, supporting multilateralism and the rules-based international order to fulfill the core mandates of the General Assembly as prescribed to it in the Charter of the UN is, is the first consideration for us. Secondly, to support the most vulnerable and people in need, including through supporting the UN humanitarian agenda is, is another important issue for us. Third, acceleration of the SDGs and the decade of action with a particular focus on the needs of the LDCs, LLDCs and SIDS is another priority and concern for us. Fourth, Gender equality and empowerment of women and girls is a main priority for us. And finally, the topic on everyone's mind, recovery from COVID-19, of course, has to be uh, top of our list. I look forward to both your questions on these priorities and your active engagement in the upcoming events. And I urge you to continue your close work with the United Nations towards a more peaceful, just, and prosperous future for all. I thank you for the time you have spent during this uh, opening uh, part of this uh, wonderful meeting we're going to have. Thank you, thank you, Excellency. And just before we start, I, I mean, I imagine when you were running to become the PGA of the General Assembly, you were certainly not imagining the circumstances and the working conditions that you are finding yourself in now. What has it been like for you um, to take on this role during this time of COVID-19? What have the challenges been personally for you? Yeah. Actually, <clears throat> when I first presented my vision uh, statement in end of January, the COVID was, uh, just showing its teeth, if I may say so, but we were not aware that it was going to be this uh, strong of a pandemic. But during the uh, election process, uh, it was there and UN went into on online and I had to make my meetings and talkings from a small room in Istanbul uh, to uh, share views with all the geographical groups, with uh, the member countries, with civil society, with anything any, any organization necessary. But even that time, I was, you know that I was advocating one thing. Even in the crisis situation, United Nations has a task and an obligation to show to the world that 
it is alive and it is taking care of what the member countries, what the people we serve is thinking. And I was not happy that everything went into online in New York. And I was saying that as soon as I come there, I have to find a solution to this. Because when, when people around the world are risking their lives, the UN personnel, which is 200,000 as, uh, as uh, peace, uh, with, uh, trying to serve the, the world for peace or for education or for fighting with um, uh, disasters, etc. I always said that we don't have the luxury to stay home and uh, keep uh, everything online. So I'm very happy that uh, uh, we are able to uh, start the General Assembly uh, in person from the day I have taken office. And until now we had uh, more, something like uh, 100 uh, General Assembly meetings in person. And, I, and for the time being, the General Assembly among the 68 uh, platforms of the United Nations, including the Security Council, uh, is the only UN body which has in-person meetings. And uh, the main committees finished their work. And uh, I think uh, this, is a, uh, this is what the UN had to do. And I'm proud that member countries, the Secretariat, and uh, everybody involved Together, we achieved this and we showed to the world that this platform is alive. Come here, send your messages. We are listening. We are going to give you uh, our replies. We, are we will take uh, uh, into account what is needed, etc. So I think uh, uh, from this perspective, I'm happy and proud that together with the member countries, we achieved this and of course, every mitigation measures were uh, in place. Not a single uh, negative result occurred in the General Assembly. And uh, it shows that if you apply the rules, if you respect the rules, but if you are also brave, as, as one of the, my predecessors said, UN needs brave people, uh, we can continue. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward Thanks. to... Thanks to for, for, for providing that. Yeah, I think it's um, it's been remarkable to see and to witness how um, the UN at all levels, whether it's deep in the field, as you mentioned, um, or it's you know here in New York headquarters, has, has kept the UN uh, churning, focused, and, and driven. And yeah, I think it is because the people who work here and the diplomat diplomats who serve it um, are 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 doing it for have have, have fi are finding more purpose than ever before with this global crisis. So thank you very much, and I, I really look forward to turning to the questions now. We have a very diverse group of representatives from civil society, and I'm going to start with Margot. Lazaro, who is representing the NGO Committee on Sustainable Development in New York and Global Family. Margot, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Under Secretary General Fleming. Good morning, Excellency. My question is, how do you plan to utilize digital technology that will engage civil society, especially from the Global South, in the SDGs to leave no one behind? Thank you. Thank you, Margot. I think this is a, a very good question, which reflects the needs and uh, necessities um, we, are, we are seeing. Uh, it has, uh, of course, several, several aspects, and COVID has really demonstrated why these issues are so important and uh, deserve a priority. Following uh, discussions with ambassadors in New York, including at one of my morning dialogues, uh, which I <clears throat> frequently have uh, on different uh, uh, subjects, I've decided to convene a world leaders uh, uh, on 27th April for a high level thematic debate on digital cooperation and connectivity. And uh, the idea is uh, to give priority to digital issues in support uh, accelerating uh, attainment of the SDGs. And as you say, leave no one uh, behind. This uh, <clears throat> thematic debate will focus on the whole of society approaches to end the digital divide. And the debate 
we will also mobilize the international uh, community to strengthen uh, and expand initiatives to accelerate access to digital technologies. Uh, this will include uh, building on the existing UN system roadmap of action on global connectivity and uh, will address issues related to digital connectivity from infrastructure and energy to uh, education and gender equality. Uh, this is incredibly important. Uh, internet connectivity and digital skills are inextricably linked to improvements in education and job opportunities and more access to information and services. So the global, uh, global uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic has accelerated this global push toward uh, digitalization. Uh, countries need support now. And if they are to avoid missing out uh, on the global shift. In terms of civil society uh, participation, I'm pleased to say that uh, the civil society engagement uh, will be prioritized in the debate on digital technologies. We are holding in-house discussions on how best to engage with, uh, with the civil society organizations for all high-level meetings, as I mentioned in my previous uh, statement, throughout the remainder of the session while keeping to existing uh, modalities. So we will be exploring avenues to best secure the most regionally represented civil society organization participation uh, possible. Uh, this includes tapping into digital opportunities, as well as asking large groups of civil society organizations to coordinate their inputs and messages. So this will allow member states to benefit from civil society's experiences, insights and action plans. And in the uh, General Assembly with uh, Biodiversity Summit and the special session on COVID-19, we also tried something different from previous, uh, uh, previous examples, uh, because the COVID-19 situation forced us to do that. So we use the screens of the General Assembly uh, so that uh, we were connected to the world for 12 hours online. So we, uh, we connected to the civil society, to stakeholders, to scientists, to uh, politicians, to, to many people from different circles. And they were with us for 12 hours on the screen. They were watching us uh, from the web, you have web TV, and uh, we were seeing them talking uh, discussing, exchanging views on our screens. And I think this, uh, this has been successfully uh, implemented and I'm looking forward to have this style in all of the meetings. This is another way that we can include the so, uh, civil society in the uh, General Assembly work uh, without, uh, without just getting uh, written messages from them. They will be here live and, uh, and we can understand each other more better that way. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, extensive answer. And the next question comes from Dr. Padmini Morty, speaking on behalf of Fanny Moonlin of the National Council of Negro Women and the Global Executive NGO Committee. The floor is yours. Thank you, Under Secretary General Fleming, Your Excellency. Good morning. What methods can be used to encourage partnerships between NGOs, governments, and private sector to accelerate the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals? Thank you. Thank you, Fanny. Uh, it's, uh, again, another good question. Uh, the, the SDGs are universal and imprinted within them is the realization that partnerships and whole of society approaches are needed, as we have mentioned. This is necessary to create the future we want. Building bridges between these sectors is needed now more than ever. And for countries with on the ground UN presence and that numbers about 170, Engaging with the UN resident coordinators and their initiatives and proposing new ones is one avenue to connect local civil society organizations with the UN. 
the other is the private sector can also engage with the UN uh, Global Compact. And the uh, civil society organizations can engage by a plethora of UN processes and uh, platforms. As the president of the General Assembly, with the authority and responsibility to convene the world on topical issues, I see my role as bringing all partners uh, and process together. This is absolutely necessary and absolutely important. So emphasizing the urgency of multi-stakeholder solutions is the first step towards building dialogues leading to partnerships. I hope this was an answer to your wonderful question. Thank you, Your Excellency, Ms. Fleming. Thank you, thank you very much. And I now invite Mr. Chest. Uh, this is a name, I hope I say your name correct, Chase Enikbitian from the Man Up, Man Up campaign. Man Up, <laughs> great. Over to you, Chess. Take uh, Chase. Thank you. thank you so much. Is it Chase or Chest, please? Chase. <laughs> Chase. Okay. The T is not pronounced. Thank you very much. It's good to see you, and um, looking forward to your to your question to the PGA. Uh, thank you so much, the distinguished and the Secretary General for Global Communication, especially recently for your Ion Board Revolution. <laughs> uh -huh. I'd also love to commend you, His Excellency, on your commitment to gender equality and cheers to UN at 75. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so my question is, how does your UN 75 work plan support gender equality in the COVID-19 environment and beyond with a focus on the health of young women? Uh, thank you, Chase. Uh, uh, thank you for your pre preliminary remarks. Uh, it was very sympathetic and uh, very warm. Thank you very much for warming our day as well from where you are. Uh, I think, uh, Gender equality uh, cannot uh, be achieved without the active engagement of men and boys. And I commend you for your engagement. First, let me reiterate that it is in the interest of society as a whole to protect and promote the rights of women and girls and to create a conducive environment for them to try uh, free of violence and discrimination. My experience uh, shows that when women and girls are equal partners in decision-making, the whole of society benefits. And women and girls must be accorded opportunities in all areas of life, namely access to education, financial literacy, political leadership, training and capacity building uh, to help eliminate the persistent inequalities that impact uh, women and girls' uh, society. As to my work plan in the 75th session, it is really focused on mainstreaming gender equality in the work of the General Assembly. We had a fantastic anniversary summit of the Beijing Declaration and the plan of action last October. I found it one of the warmest and very efficient uh, meetings we had uh, during the a high level week, or also during the time of the seventh sixth session until now. But going forward, it is about ensuring the uh, gender dimension of challenges and policy responses is picked up. Whether in our events on water or digital policy or HIV AIDS, I have uh, therefore uh, looked uh, into inserting this issue in all of these meetings. So because of the, because of, uh, the UN system, uh, which needs a lot of decisions and to move forward to agree on some modalities, etc., I established a gender advisory board under my responsibility uh, to avoid these kind of uh, bureaucratic uh, and uh, from the existence of the United Nations establish rules to provide advice and guide my work along these lines. And 
we had uh, two meetings uh, of this uh, official, uh, officially, but in the meantime, there were a lot of exchange of views, and this is helping. And the views and uh, roadmaps and, uh, or, and the uh, proposals coming out from this uh, gender advisory group is shared with the member countries and, and it's put on our website so the whole world can see them. And it is a quick way of uh, inserting into the system new ideas and uh, what are the and to assess what are the difficulties, what can be done, what shouldn't be done. So I am proud that this gender advisory board was created and it is really functioning very well. So tackling the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 on women and girls is also very important and provides an opportunity to not only overcome the immediate challenges, but to create a framework for sustainable recovery. The review on the progress of the Beijing Declaration and platform of action indicates that we have come a long way, but we have much more to do in fulfilling the promise of the ideals committed to 25 years ago. Thank you for the question. Indeed. Thank <laughs> you very much, uh, Chase. And thanks. Next, we have Mr. Sahid Yunusha from the Global Policy Insights. Sahid, the floor is yours. Where and and I would love it if um, from now on you can all tell us where you're where you're tuning in from and where you're speaking to us from. Thank you very much, Malisa. Uh, I'm speaking from um, the United States. I'm currently in the United States. Um, good morning, Your Excellency. I would like to ask, uh, what can the UN do to ensure equal distribution of vaccines all over the world, putting lives before businesses? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sahid. Uh, very nice to uh, be, be with you and uh, to be able to answer your question. Of course, a disease uh, with no respect for borders requires a collective response through multilateral cooperation with the United Nations at its core. In the beginning, there were some uh, unilateral uh, attempts, but it is good to see that uh, only if we work together, we can find a solution. And it, it once again, I prove that uh, multilateral cooperation is, is absolutely needed. So vaccines are essential uh, to overcoming this pandemic and the UN's role is absolutely fundamental. The 31st special session on the UN General Assembly on COVID pandemic, which we uh, held uh, last December, successfully demonstrated global cooperation against the pandemic and underscored what more we need to do. So the outcome of this uh, special session uh, on COVID represented a microcosm for of uh, global efforts to end the COVID-19 pandemic, safeguard humanity and, and recover better. But from the beginning, as uh, my priority is to be to, to see the difficulties of the countries in need, L LDCs, LLDCs, SIDS, middle income countries, whatever and wherever they are. I also saw that this vaccine issue is not developing in this uh, framework. And therefore, I started a campaign which is called Vaccines for All. And this has received broad support from member states. The realization that no one is safe until we are all safe was also the clear message during the UN Security Council's open debate on equitable access to vaccines earlier this week. Uh, but of course, it was also mentioned that while 10 countries are uh, enjoying uh, or having access to 75% of the vaccines, 130 countries hadn't even seen one shot. So this is a this is a bad picture. And really we have to work together and we cannot only think of ourselves, but we must think uh, together for everybody. So uh, 
Now, a new system has been established. More countries are supporting this COVAX. And this is a re remarkable mechanism. It didn't exist a year ago. And it is a result of multilateral cooperation and now has 190 members and plans to vaccinate 20% of people in participating countries by the end of next year. So I commend all contributions to the COVAX facility. And I call on all countries with COVAX-19 vaccine research and production capacity to cooperate in the UN with the UN to support this vaccines for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and it's, you know, it's great to have the president of the General Assembly delivering this powerful message day in and day out. And just to say that the Secretary General is also um, really uh, standing up for vaccine equity um, together with Dr. Ted Rose from WHO, um, calling for the financial support of the COVAX facility that the president just <coughs> mentioned, um, which will ensure that that all countries um, get get access to the vaccine. Um, we've said that nobody is safe until everybody is safe. So it's not just a moral imperative, but it is actually if, even in your own self-interest because the vaccine, as the president said, knows no borders. Uh, the the virus uh, knows no borders, and it it creates variants uh, very quickly, as we've seen. So this is one of our big, I think, uh, big. Their biggest priorities right now is to really push for vaccine equity. Um, now I'm very pleased to invite uh, Mr. Ali. Melissa, ah, uh, yes. I must uh, also commend the uh, Secretary General's role here, because uh, during the start of the, from the start of the pandemic until today, he really was the voice of the United Nations, and this. Mm -hmm. Uh, he also has continuously mentioned that the vaccines must be distributed to Very good. Yes, for some reason, the PGA screen has been frozen. So, and, uh, ah, now you're back. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why I, I must uh, give credit to the Secretary General's uh, very uh, able leadership in, in fighting with this COVID-19 and ensuring that vaccines is for everybody in the world. Yes, absolutely. So the message um, will need to be continued to be delivered also by you, our friends, civil society friends, um, because we're where uh, there's so much more to be done today. There's a, a meeting of the G7 countries and we're expecting uh, big commitments. And the, the SG is called actually on the G20 um, to, to, to really take action and put fi their financial backing and their political backing behind uh, a global distribution of the vaccine. So let's hope, hope is on the horizon. Um, it needs to be hope for, for all. Um, thank you. And I'd now like to invite Mr. Ali Mustafa from Glow Cha for his question. Over to you, Ali. Thank you, Melissa, and uh, good morning from New York. Your Excellency, President of the 75th General Assembly, the pandemic and the Secretary General's call for the global ceasefire have not stopped ongoing conflicts globally. Recently, we have also witnessed the military takeover in Myanmar and the negative impact of COVID-19 on refugees and migrants, with young people being gravely affected. How is the General Assembly addressing such situation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali Mustafa. Uh, I fully remain committed to supporting the Secretary General's appeal for a global ceasefire which is an important message uh, to enforce diplomatic action and bring hope to places that are among the most vulnerable to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Notwithstanding uh, encouraging signs in some areas, fighting still continues and new conflicts have erupted. On Myanmar, the situation is of grave concern in that uh, military coup could uh, further exacerbate the problems of the most vulnerable, including uh, the Rohingya. So it is important that the international community speak uh, with one voice in calling for the immediate release of the civilian leaders and return to the democratic process. 
as well as for unrestricted humanitarian access to Rakhine State and other parts of the, of the country. But the General Assembly and Security Council are involved in the uh, situation in Myanmar together, and uh, especially with respect to the Rohingya Muslim uh, minority. There are also mechanisms in place uh, to follow developments, uh, such as the Secretary General Special Envoy on Myanmar, uh, who has a mandate to brief the General Assembly on a regular basis. As uh, President of the General Assembly, <clears throat> I will be guided by the previous resolutions, as well as the will of the membership, to have the General Assembly serve as an important platform for broader discussion on pressing issues as, as needed and enabling participation of a wider range of member states. Uh, as in similar cases, I will remain in close contact with the President of the Security Council, which bears the primary uh, responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security, and the Secretary General, as well as interested member countries. I'm in continuous contact with the Special Envoy of the uh, uh, United Nations for Myanmar. And uh, I have uh, in mind to convene the General Assembly on the 26th of February to also give a chance to listen to the uh, Special Envoy on, on Myanmar. And of course, uh, it will give uh, us a, a, the benefit of listening things from the first, first hand. And also, uh, there, there can, we can also listen to the member country uh, views in, on that day. Much for commenting and your question on this very, very important issue um, for us at the UN. Um, our next question goes to Laura Davon, who is a social media influencer and TV personality in Colombia. Over to you, Laura. Thank you, Melissa. I am connecting from Bogota, Colombia. Hello, Your Excellency President of the General Assembly. To show the power of social media, I asked my followers on Instagram for ideas on climate action to ask the <coughs> President of the UN General Assembly. In 24 hours, I received over 6,000 responses. People want to know how the UN advocates through social media. Can you tell us how the UN ensures active participation of influencers and personalities to increase awareness and inspire action on UN priorities, including climate change? Thank you very much, uh, Laura. Uh, it's a very nice to, uh, to uh, connect uh, to a different part of the world. And this is uh, the beauty of uh, the uh, digital uh, possibilities we have. And also, of course, uh, your question concerning the uh, social media is, 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 is the life nowadays. And I think uh, social media has fundamentally changed the way governments interact with citizens and people around the world. So indeed, the whole UN system recognizes the, the value uh, of engaging the global community in conversation, particularly uh, when it comes to the defining challenges of our time, and social media is part of that. One of the tools we use uh, to communicate about climate action is the UN's Act Now campaign. Uh, which has simple changes that anyone can make in their life to minimize their negative impact on our planet. We also engage uh, with uh, celebrities and champions from around the world to initiatives like our Goodwill Ambassadors Program, which we leverage to increase the reach of our communications efforts. These, these uh, goodwill ambassadors are present in all regions of the world and cover a range of topics uh, from climate change to cities to refugees. And the number of responses you receive within a day is impressive. That says something about you as well as the issue you have raised. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that and I'm proud that somebody like you is uh, going into 
important issues uh, using the social media. And uh, when the UN engaged in, in a global conversation as part of its UN 75 initiative, climate change was identified as a leading concern and interest. And we count on every person, every company, every uh, organization, every country to take action uh, to achieve the SDGs. And uh, social media has provided an opportunity to, pro uh, to promote that. Thank you very much for joining us. All the Thank best you. to your country and yourself and to your region. Thank you. <laughs> And thanks also from from me too. Uh, just echoing what the president has said on on behalf of the Department for Global Communications, we need influencers like you to help us get out the message to the people who follow you. So thank you very much. Um, and next we have Benjamin Rubin, who is an NGO representative from Friends of Istar. Benjamin, the floor is yours. Thank you, USG Fleming. Uh, I'm Vailene from New York City, just actually right down the street from UN headquarters. <laughs> um, Your Excellency, we know that you have been instrumental in recognizing the great importance of diversifying energy routes and source countries in the past. Uh, in your role as president of the General Assembly, how are you planning to implement energy democratization in the context of SDG 7, ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all? Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. As you're on the other side of the street, I would have loved to that you walk across the street and come here. We should have hey, well, do something in, in, in the future. <laughs> yeah, soon, soon. Thank you. Thank you. Now, SDG 7 lies at the heart of both the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement. Without universal access to modern energy and greater energy sustainability and efficiency, we will not succeed in achieving many in interconnected SDGs, including those related to eradicating poverty, strengthening food security, empowering women, creating jobs, combating climate change, uh, protecting biodiversity, and ensuring digital connectivity. So everything is interconnected. As president of the General Assembly, I will do my part to galvanize urgent action on energy call for strengthened uh, political will and increased levels of investment and uh, scaled up multi-stakeholder partnerships in uh, preparation for the high level dialogue on energy, which will take place in September, 2021, this year. So this dialogue is an <clears throat> historic opportunity for us. And uh, it, it will give us the opportunity to come together, step up efforts, to build a sustainable energy future uh, for everyone. Transformational action on energy by all leaders will be critical. And uh, I commend UTAC advocates for mobilizing commitments and accelerating action in the run-up of the, of the dialogue. I have engaged with youth energy leader Anunya Bahanda, uh, and I know there are many more like you here today. I call on more youth everywhere to follow your and uh, Anunya's example. This is very important because you are in the heart of the uh, everywhere and you, you are the heart of the, uh, the solution and you, without you we can't do anything. So reducing the energy and digital device simultaneously is necessary both to contain and adopt the COVID-19 pandemic and to build back better to empower youth voices in the General Assembly, uh, I intend to give space to any SDG youth activist at the thematic debate on digital cooperation and connectivity in April. I'll be happy to do that. And I think through that uh, youth activist, we will be able to listen what the youth thinks and the youth represent will understand what we think. So it's, mm -hmm. it will be an inter interconnected uh, uh, dialogue. Thank you very much for this, uh, uh, asking this very important question, uh, Benjamin. Great, thanks, thanks, Benjamin. And now I'd like to invite Emmanuel uh, Isika <laughs> from the Youth Initiative for Economic Empowerment. Emmanuel, over to you. 
Thank you so much, ULG, Melissa, and thank you, Your Excellency, sir. You're doing a great work. Um, Emmanuel from Nigeria, and I would love to know about the UN initiative and opportunities available to accelerate Africa economy and grants geared towards digitalizing Africa. Thank you, uh, Emmanuel. <clears throat> Again, a uh, very important question. Uh, and uh, uh, the issue is uh, uh, really in the heart of uh, whatever we're facing uh, as difficulties. So according to the Secretary General's uh, roadmap on digital connectivity, it is estimated that achieving universal, affordable, and quality internet access by 2030 across Africa may cost us much as $100 billion. <clears throat> it is also estimated that there will be 230 million digital jobs in Sub-Saharan Africa by 2030. That could generate nearly $120 billion in revenue. But this would require some 650 million training opportunities over the next 10 years. So it is clear that within African countries, uh, priority must be given to the use and diffusion of digital technologies, supported by the expansion of affordable and universal digital infrastructure. As uh, previously mentioned, <clears throat> I will convene world leaders on the 27th of April for a high level thematic debate on digital cooperation and connectivity. The purpose of this uh, will be to discuss the digital divide in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and the sustainable development goals and to outline a whole of society approaches to end the digital divide. <coughs> Sorry. Regarding initiatives and resources <coughs> for <coughs> for connectivity in Africa. In September 2020, with the support of Japan and Saudi Arabia, ITU launched the Connect to Recovery Initiative. This initiative uh, aims to help lesser connected countries, especially but not exclusively the Africa region, to enforce the digital infrastructure and ecosystems and to provide the means to utilize digital technologies such as telework, e-commerce, remote learning, and telemedicine in the wake of uh, COVID-19. Thank you very much for bringing this issue to our meeting. Great, and thank you for tuning in all the way from Nigeria, Emmanuel. Um, now I am going to ask a question on behalf of Beatrice. Finn from the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Her question is, what are your plans to promote the historic treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons that the General Assembly adopted in 2017? And what steps are you taking to encourage more states to join it? Thank you. <clears throat> I thank Beatrice for uh, sending us this question. The goal of uh, a nuclear weapon free world has been central to the United Nations since its inception and the entry into force of the UN Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is an additional safeguard that can further strengthen the international proliferation and disarmament architecture. And with the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of uh, Nuclear Weapons, NPT, at its core. Looking at the General Assembly has already tasked the Secretary General to convene the TPNW's meetings of state parties and review conferences by its uh, resolution uh, 72-31, if I remember correctly, uh, of, of December 2017. So I will continue to support this uh, process. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm now going to our last two questions. I'd like Mr. Rodrique Makelele from the youth organization Vijane Africa. Over to you. 
thank you, Under Secretary General Fleming, and and Your Excellency uh, President of the Seventy Fifth General Assembly. Good morning. Uh, here is Rodrigo Makelele from uh, the DRC, calling in from the United States. I I work with uh, BioEarth and Vijana Africa, or Africa's Youth in English, uh, which promotes uh, sustainable peace through youth entrepreneurship and economic resiliency in the DRC and the Republic of Malawi. With the unprecedented challenges that the world is facing in these times with COVID-19, climate change, war, poverty, and youth unemployment, what are the partnerships that you envision could make a difference in reinforce the cohesion on fighting these challenges? And Your Excellency, what are you personally doing to help these efforts? Thank you, Rodrigue. You, you touch on a key issue, the unprecedented challenges the, the world is facing due to climate change, uh, COVID-19, uh, poverty and uh, inequality altogether. Uh, the fact is that all of these issues are interlinked and uh, mutually reinforcing. And humanity's uh, continued encroachment on the natural world, uh, on biodiversity in particular, has uh, led by all accounts to a cross-species uh, zoonotic disease that is now a global pandemic. At the same time, our disregard for forests is fueling climate change and pushing biodiversity to the brink. Tied to all of this uh, is, is the fact that inequality and poverty are rising. But just as these issues are all connected and mutually reinforcing, so too must our response be. And we cannot secure women's empowerment when education is not supported. We cannot tackle climate change without protecting forests. We cannot create sustainable economic growth while fueling disaster. The response and recovery from COVID-19 offer us an opportunity to uh, tie all of these strands together. With trillions of dollars pouring into recovery, the world has an opportunity to ensure that our efforts are guided by the principles of the SDGs, equality, resilience, sustainability. So in terms of partnerships, we need a whole of society approach to make this happen. And the UN cannot carry this alone, uh, nor can civil society or any single government. So we need governments, private sector partners, civil society groups and international organizations working in harmony. Uh, for my part, as the president of the General Assembly, I have established advisory groups on both gender and on LDCs, LLDCs and SIDS. I mentioned uh, in, in, my, uh, in an answer to a previous question, what is the reason uh, for me to do that, make it faster, and to uh, create ideas, roadmaps, and then to present it to the United Nations system and share it with the member countries and with the world's uh, population altogether. So the, these are to help steer the direction of our meetings this year, but so as to address the critical challenges uh, facing vulnerable groups. Uh, each of these advisory groups uh, includes a diverse group of people from different fields. They are all experts. They are leaders uh, in their field. They are, they are voices in their fields. And they are really contributing a lot uh, to understand what is the situation, what has to be done, what cannot be done, what should not be done. So, and the opinions they bring, the partnerships they offer are key. As a case in point, I will point to the special session of the General Assembly in December, as I did before the, on COVID, where we were joined by UN agencies, private sector partners and academics, amongst others to help push for meaningful uh, change to address the challenges thrown up by COVID-19. I think these are all uh, what we need and more dialogue like this. I think everything must be solved to dialogue and we must talk to each other, listen to each other, understand each other, 
come up with new ideas to see if they are implementable or not. I think this is the key to the to the problem and to to the solution. Thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you, Under Secretary General. Thank you very much. And we have one final question that I think is linked, and maybe uh, you you can just add. It is from. Um, Ms. Jiling Shang from the UNESCO Center for Peace. And I'll ask the question on her behalf. Uh, Excellency, what are the primary steps to move forward achieving the 2030 agenda with the current circumstances globally? So I uh, thank uh, Jiling. Uh, for this uh, important question as well. Uh, when I think of recovery from COVID-19 and the 2030 agenda, the message uh, I have said time and, time and again is that we must use this setback as a springboard to bounce back further and faster. By investing in the SDGs, uh, by using them as our roadmap to recovery, and by funneling uh, the trillions of dollars of COVID resources that are being unlocked towards a resilient, sustainable pathway, we can make progress on both fronts. We can not only rebuild, but recover better, which means more sustainable, more inclusive, and more resilient. So in many ways, for the first time, we have immense political support coupled with public support and resource mobilization. So there is an opportunity here to move forward, to change our trajectory and to look back at this, at, at the moment we pivoted towards a sustainable uh, future. One of the challenges of course remains financing and the current credit crisis has exposed, exposed uh, the extreme fragility and vulnerability of the world economy and its interconnectivity with health and climate risks. COVID recovery must address the needs and vulnerabilities of those furthest left uh, behind. On this note, one of my priorities for the session is a strong focus on the needs of countries in special situations. I mentioned uh, many times, but, and also I mentioned in my statements before, uh, including LDCs and, and the SIDS. So in order to build resilient economies and harness the potential of trade, developing countries need to establish solid strategies focusing on digitalization, service-related activities, direct investments towards technology, infrastructure, and human capital. So debt sustainability and debt standstill are necessary for many developing countries especially for, for those already at high or increasing risk of uh, external uh, debt uh, distress. Thank you very much, Excellency, and really appreciate taking your time out of your busy schedule to talk to members of civil society um, and to answer their questions, which uh, really covered, I think, the vast range of the topics and the work that you deal with day in and day out. And um, I would really like to thank everyone who tuned in to listen today. And I hope you found it as interesting as I did. I'm sure you also got some motivation to carry on your important work um, in, in making this world a better, more humane, more just and safer place. So to everybody out there, thank you very much and take care and be well.